This lesson is about the healthy uterus. It's going to the anatomy, the ligaments, and what ligament means, and a lot about the histology, what happens to the endometrium, the tissue in which an embryo would implant, and the thing that bleeds with each menstrual cycle. Inappropriately called the menstrual cycle, because it's not menstrual at all, it's uterine. To introduce this, I'm going to use the ligaments first. This is represents the pelvis. The uterus has a top, the fundus, the body, a cervix, which extends into the vagina, and two uterine tubes, formerly called fallopian tubes. But since that is an eponym, and I'm trying to remove eponyms, and fallopian doesn't tell you what it does or where it comes from, I'm going to be using uterine tube. This is obviously not what the uterus looks like. This is my best attempts at drawing it rapidly on the whiteboard. Not great, but still effective. Just as I did for the ovary, where there were two ovarian ligaments, the suspensory ligament of the ovary and the ovarian ligament, I'm going to break up the uterine ligaments as well, both embryologically and anatomically. The ovarian ligament connects the ovary to the uterus. We talked about that in last lesson. And that was from the tract of the gubernaculum. And the gubernaculum does the same thing that it does in males, only it left an anchor on the Mullerian ducts. So it's going to go forward, connecting at the mons pubis, through the deep inguinal ring. This thing is called the round ligament. Both the round ligament and the ovarian ligament are fibrous connections. They're anatomic. They hold things together. The normal position, this is the bladder, of the uterus is vagina behind the bladder, the cervix poking into the vagina, and the uterus held forward over the bladder. U ovarian tubes, and the way it's held forward, as the this is the anterior, this is the posterior, is by the round ligaments. A retroverted uterus is one that would go back over the rectum. Top of the uterus, ovarian and round ligaments. Also the front of the uterus in the natural position. There are three cervical ligaments. One front to cervix, one cervix to back, and one that comes in from the side. They're named front to back, which means that the ligament that connects the cervix to the front of the pelvis is the pubo cervical ligament. And in back, front to back, is the uterosacral ligament. Now, of course, there's two, uh, one for each side. I've chosen to pick them left and right be because the right ones are cervical, the left ones are the top front of the uterus. This one <coughs> is called the cardinal ligament. It is better named the transverse cervical, and there's even debate whether they're, they're actually different things. For now, learn both transverse cervical and cardinal ligament as the same thing, knowing that if you become a gynecologic surgeon, you may get told differently. The transverse cervical ligament, like the suspensory ligament of the ovary, is special because it carries blood vessels, lymphatics, and nerves to the cervical uterus. The only ligament of the uterus that isn't a fibrous connection that holds things in place is the transverse cervical, which carries blood vessels, lymphatics, and nerves. There is also the broad ligament, which is extremely relevant when you're doing surgery. It is a thing draped over all of the organs, especially if you put a pole into the uterus to lift it up. 
Well, you, while the surgeon is in the peritoneal cavity, when you do that, you lift all the structures up against the peritoneal cavity. The broad ligament is the lining of the peritoneum. It is the peritoneal lining that has the mesothelium and some adipose. So you're gonna see broad ligament. It does matter when you're doing surgery, but all it is is the lining of the peritoneal cavity, not a ligament. Cervix fundus, ovarian tubes. Let's talk about the blood supply. Now I'm gonna draw this in a weird way. What I'm gonna do is have the uterine vessels on the right and their anastomoses on the left. I'm gonna to try to color code this entire structure. The suspensory ligament of the ovary. Here is the ovarian artery. The cervix protrudes into the vagina. This area, the lower two thirds of the vagina, including some of the upper third with an anastomosis, is irrigated by the internal pudendal. We'll talk more about this in the next lesson. The uterine tubes, ovary, and the top of the uterus are irrigated by the ovarian artery. And you see that there's an area of overlap that is indeed intentional. There is an anastomosis opportunity here and here. The red represents the actual uterine artery and uterine territory, but even that gets a little more complicated. From the internal iliac, there is a branch called the uterine artery. It enters the transverse cervical ligament, which I'm now going to expose for you. So we can see what happens. Inside the transverse cervical ligament, it remains the uterine artery. It emerges from the transverse cervical ligament as the uterine artery. Inside the transverse cervical ligament is a branch that occurs called the vaginal artery. The reason why this is important, why I drew it out like that, is because the vaginal artery isn't separate from the uterine and it doesn't perfuse the vagina. It perfuses the, the upper third of the vagina, the thing of embryologic origin with the uterus. The lower two thirds come from something else. The upper third uterus, uterine tubes come from the malarian ducts. And so I'm trying to get ahead of the fact that you might think hearing vaginal artery, it does all of this, it does not. And the reason why this is significant is because if you're doing a procedure that involves the uterus and the uterus is bleeding, the instinct will be clamp the blood supply to the uterus, transverse cervical ligament on either side. But because there are anastomoses, you have to know that blood's coming from somewhere completely different unrelated to the transverse cervical ligament, so you may have to do something else. Specifically, internal iliac continues and gives off another branch, which is the internal pudendal. So you may need to perform more radical surgery or to clamp other ligaments. There's no ligament for the internal pudendal, 
But you, so you, you do have the suspensory ligament of the ovary as well as both transverse cervical ligaments. All right, so that's an anatomy, anatomy and vasculature. Let's talk about the epithelium. The epithelium of the uterus, the endometrium, is a simple columnar epithelium that invaginates. When a simple columnar epithelium invaginates into its lamina propria in the stomach, we call that a gland. There's a duct or a crypt in the intestines. The surface epithelium with the uterine cavity here is a simple columnar epithelium. That invaginates. And when a simple columnar epithelium invaginates, we call that glands. Just like in the skin, where epidermal structures invaginate into the dermis, but keep the basement membrane of the epidermis, or in the GI tract, where it invaginates into the lamina propria, here in the uterus, it invaginates into a stroma. A stroma is used for the non-epithelial tissue in the ovary, uterus, and breast. Stroma does not mean the same thing in each case. Specifically, this one is a hypercellular stroma. And conceptually, it's no different than the lamina propria or the dermis, but it's different than both because th those are usually mostly acellular. Here, we've got a hypercellular stroma because these are the cells that support the epithelium and are also the cells that are going to be consumed by the implanting embryo. We'll talk about that in a minute. The simple columnar epithelium and its stroma, unlike the glands and ducts of the GI tract, don't have stem cells at the base of the glands. All of this together is the stratum functionale. The endometrium is a stratum functionale and a stratum basale. The stratum basale is a very dense, there are many cells, layer of both glands and stroma. In between the glands, represented by the thicker green marker versus the wispy kind I did above. These are where the stem cells are. The endometrium is both the basale and functionale. The stratum basale proliferates to make the functionale. The stem cell niche is this layer. Beneath the endometrium is a huge, much larger than the endometrium myometrium. which I'm going to represent here by this double dash because it's through the floor relative to the sides of this endometrium. It is homogeneous and it's all smooth muscle. People like to teach that there is a perimetrium as if it's one of the three layers of the uterus. It does matter because if cancer gets through the perimetrium, then it's at an advanced stage but perimetrium is either above the peritoneal lining and we're not in contact with the body cavity, it is adventitia. Adventitia is shared by all organs not separated by a body cavity, so it's not a thing of the uterus, it's just the organ it's next to. When that organ is the peritoneal cavity, it has a serosa, which is the peritoneum. When it's not next to a body cavity, it's connected by adventitia to other organs nearby. So I want you to stay focused not on endometrium, myometrium, perimetrium. I want you to stay focused on endometrium functionale, endometrium basale, and myometrium. And further, endometrium is going to be epithelium, glands, and stroma. Independent, as you'll see in, in the disease states that we close with. So the functionality changes. How does it change? Menstrual cycles, what's usually used colloquially, 
It is more appropriately termed a uterine cycle that ends with menstruation. Now, the uterus is a simple organ. It does what it is told and does what it is told by the ovaries. The HPO axis does influence which hormone the ovaries make, but the HPO axis does not directly affect the uterus at all. The uterus will either listen to estrogen in the follicular phase, progesterone in the luteal phase, or nothing in the menstrual phase. Those phases are named differently in the uterine cycle, but they correspond to the ovarian cycles. At the beginning of the uterine cycle, menstruation has occurred, the system is revving up. The functionale is very small and then gets bigger. The epithelium rises and the stroma with it. I'm switching colors now. Green is going to be functionale, blue, basale, and red, myometrium. During the proliferative phase of the uterine cycle, the functionale rises. This stage in the cycle is called the proliferative phase, driven by estrogen. This is very important. Estrogen drives proliferation not just because this is how it works, but proliferation provides the opportunity for mutation. And in the proliferative phase, under the influence of estrogen, the stratum basale proliferates. It is the basale proliferating that lifts the functionale. Cells down here are proliferating, pushing the column of cells above it up. And it's also very important to note Throughout the entirety of the uterine cycle, the myometrium does not change. When ovulation occurs, the ovaries go from the follicular phase into the luteal phase, which is going to be for the uterine cycle the secretory phase. During the secretory phase... <laughs>